everyone, I'm Allison Morris, and you are watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. As contagious as chicken pox, some scary new warnings about the Delta variant in a CDC internal report. Do you feel safer on the job knowing that your colleagues will be required to have the vaccine? Definitely. They don't think that this vaccine is ready to use. Federal workers reacting to mandatory COVID vaccinations and testings. More on what they like about it and what they don't. Plus, thousands of Americans expecting eviction notices this weekend as the nationwide moratorium expires tomorrow. So will Congress step in at the last minute? Plus, what you should do if you get evicted. We start today with the Delta variant and the COVID situation in New Jersey. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park is at a mobile vaccination and testing site in Newark. Kathy, an internal CDC report telling us the Delta variant is as contagious as the chicken pox and breakthrough infections may be as transmissible as unvaccinated cases. Is the Delta variant one of the reasons people are showing up uh, at the vaccination site where you are? What are they telling you? Hey, Allison, it really kind of depends on on who you ask. Uh, the vaccination site uh, wrapped up about an hour ago, but we had several conversations with people who were out here earlier today. Uh, one gentleman who lives in the area said that he decided to get a vaccination because he got a, a pamphlet, a flyer from someone who was informing him about the clinic that was available. Uh, he's 71 years old. He said he stayed healthy throughout the pandemic, but because of the evolving headlines, thought it was a good idea to get the shot today. There was another person we spoke with who was encouraged to get the vaccine because he had an incentive at work, $100 if he got vaccinated. But overall, most of the people we spoke with said that it was just a matter of convenience because this mobile vaccine site was right here in their community. Take a listen. What brought you out here today to, to get your vaccine? The vaccine I needed because it's, it's good for me. And um, it took a long time. I know I did, you know, but I, I usually tend to do things at the last minute. So which one did you get today? The one vaccine. One, one vaccine. Out. Why? Why just the one? I don't need to come back. And Allison, we should note that this mobile vaccine clinic, it will be available throughout Essex County uh, until further notice. And what's interesting is that they picked this specific location here in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, this is Lincoln Park, and we're told that this is a vulnerable population. There is a high concentration of homeless people. Uh, there are a lot of people uh, battling addictions as well. There are a lot of rehab clinics in the area as well. So they made this very convenient for them. They had this mobile clinic available throughout the day. Uh, there were three vaccines available. They didn't have to make an appointment. So they've really uh, made it extremely simple. And in just a matter of minutes, uh, they were able to get at least one shot. Allison. Kathy, New Jersey's governor says the state is heading in the wrong direction. Tell us more about what's going on there. So, Allison, you might remember uh, New Jersey was one of the early hotspots and the numbers, like many states, are starting to creep back up again, including the positivity rate. We just checked a couple of hours ago. Uh, Governor Phil Murphy said that uh, there are about six deaths reported so far in the state. Um, this was actually up from yesterday. And the cases, the positive cases, are now just under a thousand. So obviously the numbers are trending in the wrong direction. They're they're keeping a very close watch on the metrics um, and and deciding what to do next. But as far as a mass mandate goes, he he stopped short of actually requiring this. But we are here in Essex County um, where the COVID cases are at a significant rise. So if you're going by the CDC guidelines, um, that essentially means if you are going indoors, even if you are vaccinated, to put that mask on. And also another update to pass along, Allison, we're, no, we're told that 10 counties here in the state of New Jersey are either in the high or significant rise in COVID cases. Kathy, I just have to ask, you say the governor stopped short of a mask mandate, uh, but is recommending it. How's that going over? Yeah, what, what's interesting, we had uh, a chance during some of our breaks to kind of walk into to some of the businesses here in Essex County. Mm -hmm. And it seems like a lot of people are asked, actually following uh, this guidance here. As I mentioned, Essex County, there is a significant rise in COVID cases. And 
most of the people that we saw inside, like a Starbucks, a grocery store, they had their masks on. Um, so clearly this is still top of mind here in Newark and beyond. But mm -hmm. um, if the numbers do continue to creep back up, I mean, the governor said that they will, you know, take drastic action if needed. All right, Kathy Park in Newark, thank you so much. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris and you are watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. As contagious as chicken pox, some scary new warnings about the Delta variant in a CDC internal report. Do you feel safer on the job knowing that your colleagues will be required to have the vaccine? Definitely. I don't think that this vaccine is ready to use. Federal workers reacting to mandatory COVID vaccinations and testings. More on what they like about it and what they don't. Plus, thousands of Americans expecting eviction notices this weekend as the nationwide moratorium expires tomorrow. So will Congress step in at the last minute? Plus, what you should do if you get evicted. We start today with the Delta variant and the COVID situation in New Jersey. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park is at a mobile vaccination and testing site in Newark. Kathy, an internal CDC report telling us the Delta variant is as contagious as the chicken pox and breakthrough infections may be as transmissible as unvaccinated cases. Is the Delta variant one of the reasons people are showing up uh, at the vaccination site where you are? What are they telling you? Hey, Allison, it really kind of depends on, on who you ask. Uh, the vaccination site uh, wrapped up about an hour ago, but we had several conversations with people who were out here earlier today. Uh, one gentleman who lives in the area said that he decided to get a vaccination because he got a, a pamphlet, a flyer from someone who was informing him about the clinic that was available. Uh, he's 71 years old. He said he stayed healthy throughout the pandemic, but because of the evolving headlines, thought it was a good idea to get the shot today. There was another person we spoke with who was encouraged to get the vaccine because he had an incentive at work, $100 if he got vaccinated. But overall, most of the people we spoke with said that it was just a matter of convenience because this mobile vaccine site was right here in their community. Take a listen. What brought you out here today to, to get your vaccine? The vaccine I needed because it's, it's good for me. And um, it took a long time. I know I did, you know, but I, I usually tend to do things at the last minute. So which one did you get today? The one vaccine. One, one vaccine. Out. Why? Why just the one? I don't need to come back. And Allison, we should note that this mobile vaccine clinic, it will be available throughout Essex County uh, until further notice. And what's interesting is that they picked this specific location here in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, this is Lincoln Park, and we're told that this is a vulnerable population. There is a high concentration of homeless people. Uh, there are a lot of people uh, battling addictions as well. There are a lot of rehab clinics in the area as well. So they made this very convenient for them. They had this mobile clinic available throughout the day. Uh, there were three vaccines available. They didn't have to make an appointment. So they've really uh, made it extremely simple. And in just a matter of minutes, uh, they were able to get at least one shot. Allison. Kathy, New Jersey's governor says the state is heading in the wrong direction. Tell us more about what's going on there. So, Allison, you might remember uh, New Jersey was one of the early hotspots and the numbers, like many states, are starting to creep back up again, including the positivity rate. We just checked a couple of hours ago. Uh, Governor Phil Murphy said that uh, there are about six deaths reported so far in the state. Um, this was actually up from yesterday. And the cases, the positive cases, are now just under a thousand. So obviously the numbers are trending in the wrong direction. They're they're keeping a very close watch on the metrics um, and and deciding what to do next. But as far as a mass mandate goes, he he stopped short of actually requiring this. But we are here in Essex County um, where the COVID cases are at a significant rise. So if you're going by the CDC guidelines, um, that essentially means if you are going indoors, even if you are vaccinated, to put that mask on. And also another update to pass along, Allison, we're, no, we're told that 10 counties here in the state of New Jersey are either in the high or significant rise in COVID cases. Kathy, I just have to ask, you say the governor stopped short of a mask mandate, uh, but is recommending it. How's that going over? 
Yeah, what's interesting, we had a chance during some of our breaks to kind of walk into to some of the businesses here in Essex County. And mm -hmm. it seems like a lot of people are asked, actually following uh, this guidance here. As I mentioned, Essex County, there is a significant rise in COVID cases. And most of the people that we saw inside, like a Starbucks, a grocery store, they had their masks on. Um, so clearly, this is still top of mind here in Newark and beyond. But mm -hmm. um, if the numbers do continue, to creep back up. I mean, the governor said that they will, you know, take drastic action if needed. All right, Kathy Park in Newark, thank you so much. President Biden now requiring that all federal workers get vaccinated or get tested. And in cities across the country, local officials are doing the same. So how's that going over? NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman hit the streets to find out. I'm honestly like, Form because I personally, I got the vaccine and I have like a cyst growing in my arm from it. And I know a lot of people are also scared about the vaccine, but I do believe in the science behind the vaccine. And I do like simply put, yes, I would feel safer if everyone had the vaccine. I was relieved and I thought it came a few months too late. I have no problem with it. Yeah, I'm fully vaccinated. I think most of my colleagues did are vaccinated. I think most of the VA, 70, 75 percent are vaccinated, I believe. I mean, it's uh, debatable. I understand the federal government, but from my point of view, I wouldn't do that if I was not said that, well, everybody did it. So you felt pressure because everyone else was doing yes. it that you had to get the yes, vaccine too. Do you regret it? Yes and no. Nobody knows how it affects it in, in the long run. A couple of my friends don't want to get it. That's their choice. And, and they're veterans and they don't want to get it. I know a couple of people. So I also really understand why people don't want to get it. Like, I do understand that. So it's really difficult. That's why I feel like it shouldn't be an either or. We should also have the weekly testing for city workers who are constantly exposed because People are still getting COVID. Do you think that they have a right to say, I shouldn't have to have a vaccine to show up at work? I think that maybe there's a reasonable accommodation they could make, that perhaps it could be 100% telework for somebody like that. I'm for the mandate or people should show by every week that they are getting the test. However, I also believe that we will fail if we don't take care of the other pieces related on how the underserved communities those were hurt the most also get all the hope to fight the virus. I think these are unusual times and I think they're exceptional times. Well, isn't it that they can either get the vaccine or they have to be tested every week? Correct. So it's not forcing them to. Let's check in with NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce one more time. She's going to hit us with an edition of the Friday headlines and then we're going to sail off into the weekend. That's the plan. Simone. First, I'm going to send us out with a very scary story out of Arizona. A deadly bee attack happened there with officials saying that at least one person died and at least two others were hospitalized after they were stung hundreds of times by a swarm of bees. So the bees apparently came from an open hive that weighed almost 100 pounds. Three firefighters were also stung in this incident and bee handlers later killed most of the swarm and then removed the hive from the area. Sheesh. All right, New York City's Broadway will require proof of vaccination when it reopens this fall. The Broadway League announced all 41 theaters will require the vaccinations for audience members, performers, and other workers through October 2021. Now, all audience members will also be required to wear masks. But children under 12, those with medical conditions, or those with religious beliefs will be exempt, but they will need to have a negative COVID test. And the U.S. and the Philippines are restoring their crucial military pact. The president of the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte, reversing his decision to terminate the visiting forces agreement, which allows thousands of U.S. troops to come in and out of the country for war drills and exercises. Now, this pact is especially important as tensions with China continue to rise. 
And an attack on an oil tanker in the Middle East has left at least two crew members dead. The tanker was linked to an Israeli billionaire and was attacked off the coast of Oman. Now, no one has claimed responsibility, but U.S. officials say it appears that a so-called suicide drone was used. The U.S. Navy is escorting the tanker to safety at this point. This incident marks the worst known maritime violence on a shipping vessel in this area since 2019. And we wrap up with some good old fashioned drama from Hollywood. So Disney is blasting a lawsuit filed by the actress Scarlett Johansson over the release of Black Widow. Johansson, who is the star of the Marvel movie, of course, sued the company on Thursday, alleging Disney breached her contract by releasing the film in theaters and on its streaming service at the same time. Now, Disney denied, denies those claims and says the suit shows, quote, disregard for the horrific and prolonged global effects of the pandemic. Allison, the reality is with the way that our media and movie consumption is changing, we're only going to see more of these disputes playing out between actors and studios going forward. Yeah, absolutely. The way movies are coming out now, very different from the way they did in the pre-pandemic world. Simone, thank you and have yourself a terrific weekend. Given the bipartisan nature of the bill, the Senate should be able to process this legislation rather quickly. We may need the weekend, we may vote on several amendments, but with the cooperation of our Republican colleagues, I believe we can finish the bipartisan infrastructure bill in a matter of days. The bipartisan infrastructure deal clearing another procedural hurdle in the Senate today, but it's up against some pretty big problems in the House. NBC News national political reporter Sahil Kapoor joining me now. So, Sahil, this isn't just Democrats versus Republicans in the House. The Dems are, are at odds themselves over infrastructure. What's going on there? That's right, Allison. A couple of different things. There is uh, a significant element of pushback among House Democrats to what the Senate is doing. Now, this is not a big surprise. The House does not like to rubber stamp the Senate uh, you know, proposals and vice versa. There's some institutional prerogatives going on here. And that includes someone like Peter DeFazio, who is the Transportation Committee chairman, who is harshly critical, uh, very critical of what the Senate is doing, says it doesn't do enough to combat climate change, there's not enough money for transit and rail, and he believes it entrenches highway-centric policies uh, that the United States should move past. There is also dissent uh, among House Democrats who are insisting that the chamber not act on this bipartisan infrastructure bill until the Senate also passes a multi-trillion dollar bill. They are worried that one could get in the way of the other and that separate multi-trillion dollar bill is their real priority. Those are the dynamics that Speaker Pelosi is dealing with in the House, and she has insisted that she will not bring the infrastructure deal up for a vote in the House until that separate bill also arrives so progressives can address their priorities at the same time. So, Sahil, there are some different but very interesting dynamics in the Senate as well. If this bill passes, it would be President Biden's first bipartisan victory. That's a pretty big deal. And so far, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell is backing this bill. You've teamed up with our colleague Benji Sarlin to ask the question, what's in it for McConnell? Why is the Grim Reaper backing a Biden priority? So what are you hearing from McConnell's uh, top allies? What's driving his decision here? Yeah, it certainly surprised a number of Democrats that uh, Mitch McConnell, who is best known for denying uh, at least among Democrats, best known for denying Democratic presidents bipartisan victories is going on with the current Democratic president's big priority. So what's going on here? Well, there are a few things. Um, he's dealing with a significant contingent of Republicans in his caucus who like this bill, who want to do a deal, you know, who came to Washington to govern and to do th to do big things and not just obstruct. This would be uh, McConnell giving the Rob Portmans, who is retiring, by the way, and uh, Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski a window to kind of release that uh, that pressure on him. There is also the issue of the filibuster. McConnell is uh, determined to preserve the filibuster and giving uh, moderate Democrats this victory would in in enhance their argument, would strengthen their argument for saying, well, the Senate is working. It's working on a 60 vote basis. You don't have to nuke the filibuster to make it work. That's the argument that Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema have been making. If they get this bipartisan deal, uh, which both of them, by the way, are helping write, then that would give them uh, kind of a, a you know a, a cudgel to go back to the left and say, no, we don't need to nuke the filibuster. Beyond that, infrastructure is popular. There's not a whole lot of opposition, and there's not a whole lot to lose for McConnell if he were to allow this to pass and not be seen as you know and, and be seen as supporting it rather than fighting to stop it. It's a very different dynamic than, for instance, 
the health care law in 2009 under President Obama, the conservative base was very riled mm. up over that, which is one of the reasons he fought to, uh, to stop it unsuccessfully. Sahil, another issue on the Hill, voting rights. I understand Speaker Pelosi uh, and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer met with President Biden today. Uh, progressive Democrats have been pushing for a scaled down voting rights bill. Do we know anything about that meeting just yet? They are talking about what to do on the John Lewis Voting Rights Enhan Enhancement Act. Uh, sorry, Advancement Act, not Enhancement. Um, and that is the next voting rights proposal that Democrats expect to bring up. It's supposed to come up sometime in the fall, and that bill itself it's been around for uh, some time now, and what it would do is it would require states with a history of racial discrimination to get pr federal pre-approval before changing their voting laws. What Democrats want to do is add some provisions of that separate For the People Act, which has stalled out in Congress because of a Republican-led filibuster. They want to add pieces of that to the John Lewis bill. That includes things like same-day registration. It includes 15 days of early voting and universal access to mail-in voting. So in a way, it's a slimmed down bill compared to the For the People Act, but it's a plus up uh, John Lewis Act, which they hope to pass sometime this fall. Of course, this faces the same problems in the Senate. Republicans are not on board and they don't have the votes right now to nuke the filibuster or create a carve out for voting rights. All right. So many similar issues we're dealing with uh, on so many different bills. Sahil, thanks so much and have a great weekend. You too. In a major reversal, the Justice Department now saying the IRS must give former President Trump's tax returns to Congress. In a new opinion released today, the Office of Legal Counsel says the House Ways and Means Committee has given sufficient reasons for requesting that information. NBC News Justice correspondent Pete Williams joining me now from Washington, D.C. Pete, back in 2019, the same Office of Legal Counsel backed the Trump administration, saying Congress had no legitimate legislative purpose for seeking Trump's income taxes, that they were just looking for something to embarrass him. Why is the office changing its mind now? What are they saying? They're saying on second thought we were wrong. Uh, they basically say that that early opinion was in error, that it uh, said that the Congress didn't have a, le a legitimate purpose. But now the Office of Legal Counsel says the law is the law. It says that when any of the three tax writing committees ask the Treasury Department and the IRS for individual returns, then the government must, or shall is what the law says, turn them over. End of story. So what OLC now, the Office of Legal Counsel now says is that uh, by saying that the Congress didn't have a legitimate purpose back in 2019, that wasn't giving sufficient respect and deference to a co-equal branch of the government. And that's why it was wrong then. And that's why Treasury must turn this over now. Pete, so how soon could the House Ways and Means Committee have those tax returns? And a fan favorite question I always have to ask, does this mean the public could see them in any way as well? I don't know and no are the answers to those questions. And let me tell you why. <laughs> okay. So there, there's a longstanding lawsuit that is actually still in federal court over this, over whether the Congress has the ability to get these returns or whether the Treasury can legitimately stiff the Congress over these. Uh, a joint status report is due today, and presumably that's one of the reasons why this OLC opinion came out today. Earlier, the parties, both the Treasury Department, now under new management, uh, and the Congress said they were close <laughs> to an agreement on this. So what the agreement also says, though, is if the Treasury concludes that it will turn this material over to Congress, it will give the president 72 hours notice for him to try to block it in court. So that's the I don't know part, how soon it would happen, because if the president does try to block it, I mean, I think most legal experts would say the law is pretty clear here. He doesn't have much of a good argument. But if he does try to block it, he could slow it down. Now, part two about will the public see it? And the reason I said no is that what the law says here is if Congress is going to get this material from IRS, it has to be kept confidential. Now, there is a procedure by uh -huh. which the House could vote to make it public. But, you know, that could take time. And uh, that also sets a precedent here about making presidential tax returns public against a president's wishes. And that's going to be politically yeah. very dicey. But, you know, I, I suppose it's theoretically possible we may ultimately see them, but not anytime soon. All right. It's, it seems like the wait and see will continue a little bit. Pete, separately today, the House Oversight Committee released notes from a call former President Trump had with top DOJ officials back in December, where he pressured them to declare the 2020 election corrupt. Tell us more. 
Yeah, these were notes taken by the man who was acting as deputy attorney general. Remember, this was two days after Christmas, after William Barr had stepped down as attorney general. So we had an acting attorney general, Jeffrey Rosen, and we had an acting deputy attorney general, Richard Donahue. These are Donahue's notes of a telephone call that was made by the president to those two men on uh, two days after Christmas, December 27th. And they say that he was asking them to look further into these claims of uh, election fraud. And he, he raised one uh, case about Pennsylvania, for example. And they said, well, all right, we will check on that. But according to the notes, Rosen told him, the acting attorney general, you know, the Justice Department doesn't just snap its fingers and say that the election has to be undone or something was wrong. And the president, according to these notes, replied, uh, you don't need to do that. Just say there was corruption and let me and the House Republicans do the rest. All right, Pete Williams, a whole lot going on for a summer Friday. Thank you for running us through all that and have a really nice weekend. You too. Just a few more miles to go. The Poor People's Campaign, nearing the end of their four-day, 27-mile march in Texas, recharged today by the news that state lawmakers are working on a revised voting bill. NBC News Now correspondent Priscilla Thompson is in Austin. Well, Allison, those marchers have wrapped day three, 27 miles in, and some of them telling me that they feel better today than they did when they started marching. And I caught up with one family. It was their first day out here today. Three generations came out. So the grandparents, a husband and wife, and they also brought their three young children, six years old, nine year old, and one year old. And I asked them why it was so important to be marching with their children today. I want to play a little bit of what the mom shared with me. They're growing up in a state where it's already really difficult to vote for too many of us. They understand the importance of, of you know, making sure that we work to protect the vote, making sure that we work to, to um, stand up for, for all of us, not just some of us, um, making sure that, that they understand the importance of um, we as people have agency, we can push for change, we can work with our lawmakers, we have that power, we are not voiceless. So uh, we've I've always really tried to raise them to, to understand that, to understand that they have power, they have agency, they can push for the change they want to see. And I also spoke with their nine-year-old son, Liam, who tells me he does feel like he's making a change by being out here. He marched the first two miles today. Um, and this is not over. These folks are going to be at the state capitol tomorrow rallying. It is open to everyone. Uh, former Congressman Beto O'Rourke uh, and Reverend William Barber have put out the call telling people to be here. We know that there are going to be celebrity performances, including Willie Nelson delivering a performance and also a 151 car caravan that is going to travel that same path that these marchers did from Georgetown to Austin. And they are going to be led by a hearse with a casket in it that is going to be full of bills that Reverend Barber says are being used to bury people's civil rights. So it is sure to be quite a day here in Texas on Saturday. It isn't about any more money. The money is there, resting in localities and uh, governor's offices across the country. So we would like the CDC uh, to uh, expand the moratorium. That's where it can be done. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi making an 11th hour push to extend the federal eviction moratorium. It expires tomorrow. 3.6 million people are behind on their rent this month, month alone, according to the Census Bureau. NBC News political reporter Vaughn Hilliard joins me now from Cobb County, Georgia. Vaughn, you've been speaking with families who are getting eviction notices already, including a new mother of twins. What are they saying about this deadline? Yeah, I wanted to let you just hear from this mother, Brianna Brimage. She literally had twins, Allison, a week ago today, Friday. The very next day, her mom went to the house to go and pick up clothes, and on the front door was an eviction notice. She brought it to the hospital, and it was in the hospital with her newborn twins where Brianna saw that eviction notice there. And now she's awaiting this court hearing here, and she could potentially be evicted at any moment with that eviction moratorium. Uh, coming tomorrow and with Capitol Hill having yet passed an extension. I want to let you hear part of my conversation here with Brianna. How did you find out about the eviction notice? Um, my mom, you know, she was checking on the apartment, going back, getting clothes for me, bringing them home. And, you know, when she came to the house, they left it on the front door. It was um, taped to the front door. Your eviction notice. 
And you were at the hospital when your mom told you? Yeah, she came, you know, brought it up to the hospital when she came to bring my clothes. What are you going to do? I'm trying to find, you know, assistance to be able to pay it. But as far as from now, I don't have, like, a plan. You see the three kids sitting next to Brianna, as well as another mother, the two mothers, uh, uh, they actually met here in this hardship together. They both received their eviction notices here this week. Sierra Green and Brianna uh, Brimage, however, are just one of 3.6 million families that are facing eviction here, telling the census this month that they don't expect to be able to likely be able to pay uh, their rent and expect to be evicted here over the next two months. Yeah. This is a really tough reality for these families here in the heart of summer, in the heart of a pandemic, and with kids on the line here and just a basic home uh, that they have been able to go back to here. Uh, that's on the line here in these coming days, Allison. Vaughn, uh, millions of people here hoping for a last minute uh, Hail Mary from Congress before the House goes on recess. And if you check your watch, there isn't a whole lot of time left. Uh, what's the latest? Any updates or uh, any progress in Congress? Uh, I understand they were still talking this afternoon. Yeah, the reality is, is that it's unlikely that an extension is going to be passed here. And yeah. you played Speaker Pelosi's soundbite there saying that she wanted to bring this up for a, a vote. But the latest here in just the last hour from our great Capitol Hill team is that that is unlikely to come up for a vote in the U.S. House, uh, where it would be more likely to pass than uh, than in the U.S. Senate, which would require a 60 vote majority. Uh, and so suddenly we are dealing with uh, the reality that 3.6 million individuals could very well be evicted here in these coming weeks. And the hardest part about that is, is that there's literally a pot of money that was passed as part of the relief packages earlier this year, intended to go to renters and landlords. Yet just a small fraction of the percentage of that money has actually been doled out, which was a big reason why advocates of extending this moratorium were calling for an extension, because folks like Brianna and, uh, uh, and other families are eligible potentially for that very funds. But at the same time, because of the paperwork and the documentation it requires, the backlog at a government level, that money has not made it to them and they face eviction uh, uh, potentially as a result, Allison. Oh, it's just an awful situation. Vaughn, thanks so much for your reporting today. Thank you, my friend. So what should you do if you get an eviction notice? NBC News Now correspondent Moore Barrett explains. 3.6 million Americans say they will likely have to leave their homes in the next two months due to eviction. We call eviction the scarlet E uh, because when a family faces an eviction, people who face an eviction are then often barred from getting access to housing, to jobs or to loans um, as they you know, recover from the experience of an eviction. But if you do find yourself with an eviction notice on your door, no matter where you are, experts all agree. The number one thing you can do is find an attorney. The more you can get that advice, I think the better because these processes can move quickly. There's a lot of complicated paperwork. If you're doing it for the first time, it's likely you can make a mistake. So talk to that attorney, get that advice. You can go to your local federal legal services office. They're usually free, or they may refer you to a nonprofit legal provider for eviction cases. When you go, it's important to bring the receipts. Documenting everything you can, if you can take photos of um, any interactions you have with your landlord, um, take photos of your possessions or any um, anything that could be used in, uh, in court proceedings to help uh, defend your case. Even if you haven't yet received an eviction notice, experts urge that if you're struggling to pay rent, you should access the billions of dollars of rental assistance made available by the federal government. Okay, you're good to go. There is a historic amount of rental assistance available. The Biden administration has allocated over $46 billion to renters in the U.S., but what we've seen is that that rental assistance money is not reaching people in time. And so what that means is that tenants who are waiting in line for their rental assistance checks to clear may face eviction in the weeks ahead. There's plenty of that assistance to go around, but not all of it is being used. NBC News contacted all 50 states and the District of Columbia about their emergency rental assistance programs. Of the 41 that responded, 26 have distributed less than 10% of their first allocations. I have plenty of money to give. What I need is applications and I need time. 
And can people still access the rental assistance even after they are potentially at risk of eviction or when they get that eviction notice? Absolutely. The timeline can be long, but the sooner you get in the line to receive that funding, the more likely you are to receive it before that eviction trial or that hearing takes place. After you've spoken to an attorney and after you've applied for rental assistance is with the guidance of your attorney potentially to reach out to your landlord and just let them know that you're waiting on that rental assistance. Uh, in a lot of cases, the rental assistance that's available can not only pay all of the back debt, but also pay several months of rent into the future. And so if your landlord is willing to wait, that check that they're going to receive is potentially really significant. The stakes are high as this eviction moratorium comes to a close. The same communities that um, have been affected by layoffs, that have been affected by COVID-19, um, they may be at risk of both losing their homes and also contracting you know, COVID-19 or the Delta variant at this critical time. But the impacts of an eviction can last long after a family is out the door. The consequences uh, of an eviction wave will be multi-generational. It's a, a traumatic, adverse childhood experience for kids who have to go through that as well. Um, but we also know that moms who experience an eviction uh, suffer from depression up to two years after um, that experience. That multi-generational impact causing both emotional and financial setbacks. Advocates hoping this rental assistance can change that. Eviction is often talked about as being the result of poverty. And, and really in the United States, it's often the cause of poverty. And so it's a very frightening moment for that reason. And it's why it's so important state and county governments really move quickly to get that rental assistance dollars out the door. Because those federal funds can resolve those debts and they can prevent evictions from taking place. With this uh, new step of the Israeli government, which I'm proud as the president of the state of Israel to launch, I believe that it's also a lesson to the entire humankind that we have to protect each other. Israel now giving a third booster shot to people that are over 60. NBC News global correspondent Raf Sanchez has more on why the country made the decision. Allison, Israel has led the world at so many different stages during this pandemic, and it is doing so again today. Israel had the first and fastest mass vaccination campaign earlier this year. A few weeks ago, it became the first country in the world to start giving that third dose to people who have weakened immune systems. And today, all Israelis over the age of 60 are now eligible for that third Pfizer dose the very first person to get that booster shot today was Israeli President Isaac Herzog. He is exactly 60 years old. He just qualified. He was joined at the vaccination center by Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, who made the decision yesterday to go ahead with this vaccination campaign. The prime minister said this decision was driven by data coming from Pfizer and from the Israeli health ministry that is now starting to show pretty comprehensively that six months after you are fully vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine, your antibody levels do start to decline somewhat. So Pfizer says in the period immediately after you're fully vaccinated, you have about 96% protection against symptomatic COVID. But six months on, that number slumps to around 84%. Now that is still high. High. But remember, the people who were vaccinated first in Israel, the people who are now hitting that six month mark, are the elderly, are the people with weakened immune systems. And so Israeli authorities have said now is the time to go ahead and make sure that they have the extra protection that they need. Now, this experiment in Israel is being closely watched by the U.S. The position of the CDC for now is still that fully vaccinated Americans do not need a booster dose. But remember, Israel is a couple of months months ahead of the U.S. There are not that many Americans who have been fully vaccinated for six months now, whereas a relatively large proportion of the Israeli population has been vaccinated for that long, is starting now to hit the point where those antibody levels are starting to slip. And as Delta cases continue
continue to rise in Israel, that country now moving ahead to try to give that extra level of protection. And Allison, this is an experiment that is going to be closely watched around the world. I think people should know that, that something happened in here and, um, and the memorial is probably the, the best way to be able to explain that to, to people who, who didn't live through this. An emotional plea from the families of the Surfside condo collapse. Make the site a memorial, not another building. A legal battle is heating up as they wait to see who will buy that property. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber sat down with a grieving family who lost four loved ones in that condo collapse. Allison, this is a complex legal battle that could put families, individuals who survived the condo collapse against those families who lost loved ones. A judge here ruled that this property can be sold. It's a beachfront property worth over a hundred million dollars. He appointed a steering committee to try and quickly establish a track for property litigation because this needs to happen fast. People who survived, according to the judge and others, they need this money to try and rebuild their lives. It's now really a question of who buys it and what they do with it. Is it a developer who builds a new fancy condo? Is it a philanthropist or the government? A group of people stepping in, buying it, and turning it into a permanent public memorial. We spoke to three people all connected and not just by this nightmare. The people they lost were all related by blood or by marriage. Nikki and her husband Luis were newlyweds who lived on the eighth floor. They planned to have a bigger wedding after the pandemic. Moises and Andres both recently graduated from the University of Florida. Andres was supposed to get married in August. Moises, Andres and Luis were all cousins. Their families are pleading for a permanent memorial and nothing else. Here's what they told us. One thing that we knew right away is that we didn't want to see another fancy building on Surfside at the site of the collapse where we lost our loved ones. I'd like to go often and remember them and honor them and maybe go to the beach where we used to go to. Maybe seeing that place in respect as a green area, it will show that it's not about, you know, buildings, money, it's about respect. A spokesperson with the Condo Board Association declined our request for an on-camera interview. Governor Ron DeSantis, his office, told us in a lengthy statement that they don't have any jurisdiction here because it's not public lands. The families we spoke to, they would really like for the White House, President Biden specifically, to weigh in on this. President Biden visited this site. He met with the families. They say he is one of the few people who can truly understand their grief. Today is World Day Against Trafficking in Persons, or Human Trafficking. This year, the focus is listening to and learning from survivors. So listen here as two survivors share their stories and advocates explain what we can do as a country to help other women like them. I was trafficked in my early 20s by a man that I really thought cared about me. He abused me, starved me, and then eventually uh, sold me. I think what most people think is once you're away from that abuse that like things go back to normal, <laughs> but there really isn't um, there really isn't a normal after that. Rebecca Carey is a survivor of human trafficking. It's considered among the fastest growing criminal industries in the world and affects approximately 25 million people. In the U.S., sex trafficking has been reported in all 50 states, and one in six runaway children are likely to become a victim. Well, I ran away for the first time at 11 years old. I was approached very shortly after I ran away by an older woman down the street. She built a relationship with me to the point that I even called her mom. She took me to parties with a lot of older men. I was raped at one of these parties, and she actually celebrated. She told me that she was grateful that got, that was out of the way. She started taking me to parties and forcing me to sleep with men for her drug addiction. Human trafficking doesn't always involve sex. It can include forced labor, marriage, torture, and sometimes organ removal. 
It's not like what you see in the movies. Human trafficking is not like black and white. It is very complex. It's very dark. It's very um, complicated. But when we say, hey, human trafficking looks like the movie Taken, <laughs> which is so bad because that's not accurate, that victims who have been trafficked like me, which is the majority, will never self-identify because they think it looks like one thing when it really is so much more than that. I get really frustrated when a lot of people think, um, oh, does this really happen here? Yes, it's happening right under your noses. It looks like the addicted mom selling her daughter. It looks like the controlling boyfriend. It's so plain in front of your faces that a lot of people either discount it or they ignore it, which is disturbing. For Carla and Rebecca, transitioning back into society after their abuse wasn't easy. The 15 years that I did not self-identify, I was doing things that were putting me on a path for a destruction. I would honestly say relationships were the hardest thing for me to figure out. I always expected someone to want something from me rather than just love me for who I am. I dealt with very, very tormenting memories um, and it actually resulted in me attempting to take my own life. That was the day uh, I tried to throw in the towel and God threw it in my face and said, no girl, you got work to do. Today, both women have dedicated themselves to helping others with similar experiences adjust to new lives. Finances is something that we have all struggled with. Coming back into a secure and safe, stable place and then having to all of a sudden do for yourself, this is something that has never really been taught to me until recently. There are a lot of obstacles when it comes to survivors and in the, the workforce as well as uh, everyday living. And that's why economic empowerment is so important. In April, the House of Representatives passed a bill to help survivors of human trafficking repair their credit. This simple four-page bill has the potential to help thousands of victims every year by ensuring that a consumer reporting agency may not furnish a credit report with adverse information from a severe form of trafficking. While this does not erase the terrible crimes committed against them, it will help victims regain their financial freedom and begin to rebuild their lives. Advocates are pushing the Senate to pass the bill too. But in the meantime, some experts think there's more work to be done in the private sector. The gap that needs to be filled is going to come from businesses because the tool that businesses have, the thing that they have, the golden ticket they have is a job. Shannon Deer and Cheryl Miller are co-authors of an upcoming book entitled Business Doing Good. It's their attempt to alert American businesses to the potential benefits of hiring women with challenging pasts. You can teach all the technical skills in the world, but if you want to hire for resilience and grit, hire women overcomers. It's the mindsets of some people that, are, that think, well, they're not ready for the workforce or we can't take the risk on these employees. And my response to that is, well, gosh, that's a shame because these are going to be some of your most valuable employees because they bring non-traditional skills into the workplace that they've learned by surviving all the things that they've survived. Miller knows how a job can change a woman's life. It's impacting generations. It's not going to only change her life, it's going to change her children's life and her grandchildren's life. And it has a really exponential impact. We're strong. We're resilient. We've survived something that a lot of people couldn't even wrap their minds and their thoughts around. So if I was a business owner, I would want to hire survivors because that, to me, is giving a survivor another chance, a chance at life, a chance at freedom. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.